Your Excellency and honored guests, friends, students, fellow professors, people from around the Doha community, welcome, ahlan wa sahlan, fi Jamaat Qatar, Jamaat Georgetown, fi Qatar. Of course, our friends at Jamaat Qatar are also welcome, as always. We work with them whenever we can. Um, and I want to say a welcome, a hearty welcome. My name is Gerd Nonemann. Some of you might have seen me before when I was a dean of this wonderful place. Uh, that term has come to an end, but as I was telling our, gu our guests earlier, it is such a wonderful place, I couldn't tear myself away. So I've stayed on as a professor here, focusing on uh, the study of the Gulf. And it's a particular pleasure to be able to welcome His Excellency Abdullah bin uh, Mohammed bin Saud Al Thani again to uh, Georgetown. Last time he was here, it's four years ago, and again, it was a, it was a wonderful event. At that time, uh, he was not yet with Qatar Investment Authority, but I'm sure he will tell you about that himself. Um, and I'm delighted to be able to bring him back um, at this point now that a whole generation of students have passed on and there's a whole new generation of students. But I'm happy to say I see various students who were here then still in the audience. That's another typical thing for Georgetown in Qatar here. The alumni stay very much part of the family and they keep coming back. In fact, I know there are people here from, even from the very first class uh, that graduated in 2009 and all the way through. So it's a wonderful pleasure to welcome you all. But I, I said, I, made a, I, made, I said something that I shouldn't have said. I said, uh, it's a pleasure to bring His Excellency back here. The credit is not really mine. Uh, the institution, Georgetown and myself, are perfectly happy to go along with it, but really, this was the initiative of the one uh, student society uh, led by Haya Al-Thani and Mohammed al kuwari It's their work, really, that made this event happen. And that's another thing that's, I think, typical of our students and typical of Georgetown University. So thank you, uh, Haya and Mohammed and the whole team at the one student society. So, uh, let me briefly introduce His Excellency to you, although he's one of those people where one has to say he needs no introduction, but even so, that's part of my role, so I'll do it. Um, His Excellency Sheikh Abdullah bin Mohammed bin Saud Al Thani is, of course, the Chief Executive Officer of Qatar Investment Authority, or QIA. He's also a member of the Supreme Council for Economic Affairs and Investment, and he's Chairman of the board of Oridu, the Oridu Group. Beyond that, he's got a number of other functions. He's board member of uh, QNB, of Harrods, I discovered as well, and of the International Forum of Sovereign Wealth Funds. But he was trained originally as a military officer, um, both in Egypt and at the US Army War College. And he, in fact, he graduated as a, as a pilot in the Qatari Amiri Air Force. His Excellency also serves as a commissioner to the United Nations ITU Broadband Commission for Digital Development. And, not least, he's a member of the World Bank's Advisory Council on Gender and Development. Previously, he served, I'll just pick out a few things of the many uh, functions he's fulfilled and roles he served in. He served as President Commissioner of Indosat when he was based in Indonesia. Before joining Uridu, or as it was then called, I forget what it's then called. <laughs> Indeed, can you tell? Um, you see, history has been made. And, um, he was chief of the royal court, or the Amiri Diwan, and he was a member of the planning council in Qatar from 2000 to 2005. In fact, in between all that, he also served, I recently discovered, as a military attaché to the United Kingdom from 1990 to 2000. I will leave it there, so just to leave as much time as possible for His Excellency's presentation. After the presentation, um, we will have a question and answer sessions. I've got a few questions in mind already, um, but think of questions yourselves, and as His Excellency presents to you, I'm sure more questions will pop up. So without further ado, over to Your Excellency. You talked uh, 
a lot about the positions uh, I took, and I, I do not want them to uh, overestimate that I will give a lot of information. I'll try to give uh, as much as I could, but uh, if, you, if there is anything I did not cover and you wish to know, please just, you know, after the uh, lecture or whatever you want to call it, just ask the question. But bear in mind, sometimes I, I answer questions, sometimes I do uh, uh, flip around. So <laughs> I'll do my best. Well, thank you, uh, Professor uh, Namanen, for your kind uh, introduction. Uh, I should say good evening, everybody, and uh, also assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I heard that uh, His Excellency Al Atiyah was here a week ago, and uh, he spoke at length about the blockade. Well, no one can be better than him uh, to talk about it, and also he's a senior citizen, so he can say whatever he wants. I have to be very careful what to say. <laughs> so really, I was uh, actually in uh, trouble, so I had to mobilize and adjust my brief very quickly because I do not want to cover everything he covered. So I, I really, maybe I went away or diverted a bit from uh, the uh, lecture, but again, as I said, if you needed to ask any question regarding the, uh, the uh, title of the uh, lecture, please do. I also added some uh, flavor uh, to, the, uh, to the lecture so that I gave an example of true experience of success that I will hide, highlight uh, shortly. I will also focus on uh, what happened into the banking system under the blockade and how we are uh, overcoming it. Uh, actually, when you look in the blockade in general, you won't uh, feel a lot, but I think in the banking system where uh, is really a bit where uh, the uh, work had to be done. I also noticed that this is a uh, series of lectures leading up to the National Day, and this is the final. And I thank uh, Haya and uh, Muhammad Al-Kawari. Where is Muhammad Al-Kawari? I've heard his name, but I didn't see him. I so, you know, I thank them uh, for making me to come uh, the last and in the uh, spirit of the National Day, I have a small talk in here. So after the lecture, uh, it will be available to every one of you here. I was here before as chairman of QTEL, Qatar Telecom. Well, as you all know, QTEL does not exist anymore. This clip will show you what happened. The moment of truth. <laughs> our new brand embodies our customer promise of a human growth. A new brand which reflects and conveys our approach to customers. A single brand that will unify the whole cuter group with a single look and feel. It's playful and engaging. It reflects confidence, energy, and empathy. We are adding color and personality and we are introducing a new name to unite the entire group. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you our new identity, Urido. Now, from this moment on, we are Uridu.
Thank you. Well, just before I uh, go further, I have here with me uh, Dr. Nasser. He was a group CEO, and now he's a board member of uh, the group. He was uh, uh, my friend uh, through all the uh, success of Oridu. So today, I am here as chairman of Oridu, the new face of Qatar Telecom and the CEO of Qatar Investment Authority. As you said, it was four years ago. Well, uh, it's good to be back after four years. I don't know if this is a good sign. <laughs> Actually, it's a good strategy. You can give the same speech. You, need, you don't need to uh, change it. <laughs> Today, I want to talk about what it takes to grow and be successful in your life and your career. Well, let's start from here, from Georgetown University, where we are all assembled. Why did, uh, why did you end up here? Why George, Georgetown is here, Cornell, Carnegie, Northwestern, and many more. Why the Education City is here? The answer is because Qatar's leadership recognized that for a country to be a success, it must have an eligible population. Knowledge is a required ingredient for the success of any society and any organization. A knowledge base. Society is an integral element of Qatar's 2030 vision. By the way, there are four elements of uh, Qatar uh, 2030 vision. Please, uh, you have to know them, because as soon as you hit the work, you will hear them a lot, you will work around them a lot. They are the economical development, social development, human development, and the environmental. So what is knowledge? Where does it come from and how is knowledge-based society superior? A society that is built on human knowledge and contribute its experience to the knowledge is a society that succeeds. Please keep these three words in mind. Experience, knowledge, success. How is knowledge communicated and shared? A knowledge is passed from one generation to another within society, organization, and also within an institutions like Georgetown. It is shared through communication. Without sharing, knowledge is simply lost. In order to share knowledge, you have to communicate it to others. For most of human civilization, knowledge was shared verbally. It was only 5,000 years ago that humans invented writing, a new way of sharing knowledge. Writing is a better way to preserve knowledge. And more recently, in the past 100 years, it became possible to transmit knowledge electrically and electronically via cables, airwaves, audio, video, and text. In Qatar, this is the role that Uridu plays. It gives people access to knowledge and easier sharing of knowledge within Qatar and beyond. Uridu plays a key role in Qatar's 2030 vision. It enables knowledge-based society in Qatar that's seeking. So what is experience? How do we acquire it? Uridu began as a small telecom company, small operator here in Qatar. In 2005, after many heated debates, the board of QTIL agreed to expand beyond Qatar. Many times in life, if for every decision, you will be faced with so many options. For us to expand or not, it was a 50-50 chance. Then you start thinking, which countries of the 200 around the globe? Is it a single name or a group, or a group of companies? Now chances are no more 50-50. Rate of success becomes very small, chances of failure becomes very big. It wasn't an easy decision. Look back now after 10 years Qtel transformed itself into a global telecom provider operating in more than 10 countries. I am very proud to say that we are now one of the fastest growing brand ranking number 10 in the Middle East. With, an equity, with equity value more than $3 billion in less than five years. That's a big jump. By doing so, we expanded our knowledge. We redo acquired companies with existing knowledge that we were able to use. We learned from them, but also we added our own experience to it. 
I have a simple question. If we had stayed here in Qatar, have we learned the same experience operating in one country with two million customers? Keeping quiet? Well, I think I heard no from you all. By operating in a multiple countries and serving 153 million customers, we built our own experience multiple times faster. Talking about success, let's, just before I jump into success, let's say experience yield success. Now let's talk about success. I'm going to talk about three of the 15 countries. We, have, we, we acquired them, and everyone is unique. But I've chosen three. And the reason is with the complexity on those three. Let me uh, start talking about Iraq. When we acquired the group of Wataniya Kuwait, it was supposed to be Iraq among those countries. And uh, my friend Dr. Nasser here remembers that when we went in, in the discussion, we discovered that the uh, relationship between the company and the group was dysfunctional. It wasn't working. No one talked to each other. There is no upgrade. There is no uh, there, is, there is no even uh, synergy between the two companies. So either that can break the deal or make the deal. So after, again, a few discussion, we decided let's go ahead, do it, and then think of Iraq later on. So we did so, and then we had to sit with the Iraqis. I remember one of them said to us, why you are here? What is different between you and your colleague? So we started um, uh, capitalizing on our investment in Oman, show them our vision, our strategy, what value we added to those companies. And then we started getting them on board. Then we showed them what the synergy could be, what value they will, uh, they will take out from that. And then I remember I was on my vacation and I was in the end of the world, uh, down under, and the call at, at, the, at 3 o'clock in the morning came that the, dine has, uh, this, uh, the uh, deal has been done and the signing has to be done as soon as possible so I have to break my leave and come back. So Iraq now, one of the most profitable company, although they go under problems between time and time because of the, uh, of the political risk uh, in, in Iraq, but it's doing remarkably well. The shareholders extremely happy with a group like uh, Uridu. Then came Indosat, another acquisition. It is our biggest acquisition. And let me tell you, sometimes that passes uh, quickly. But before we acquire Indosat, we hardly can talk to Facebook, Google, or Apple. Or Apple. They never used to answer even calls. They don't want even to meet a small company like Uridu at that time or Qtel, why they talk to. So what we did, after acquiring uh, uh, Indosat. It is the scale people look after. So we started getting the call from them back to us. And then relationship started to, be, to come at an equal uh, level with, with those companies. And Indosat was a, a miracle. I remember we just went in because we thought that there is a problem. We can fix it. Got into the, uh, with, the, uh, with our friends in the, uh, Singaporeans. <clears throat> And from there, the Singaporeans started to have even more issues. So we had to intervene. And we thought, by being from the Middle East, we could fix it. We could not create the relationship or the synergy between both. So in the end, the company uh, had to uh, give up uh, you know, doing any more work or logistic. So we had to intervene and acquire Endosat. So Endosat, being in Orido Group, was the real flip and the real, really leap for Orido Group. Then, Myanmar came as, as a company. Myanmar is, is a unique. It happened just months after we changed our brand. So really, to go and compete for a, for a license, who are you? We never heard of you, because Qtel is no more there. It was Orido. So I remember when we went to buy the booklet, they said, who are you? So he said, we are, we are just taking the document and going. So we took the document and we found out that 92 companies competing for Myanmar. 
92. Some of my friends in the plane, coming back from Myanmar, they decided just, you know, we should not waste time. Forget it. So, between a discussion between me and the board, and of course, Dr. Nasser as a group uh, CEO, we said, no, we will go in. We will not uh, you know, give up from the uh, first uh, moment. So we went in, and the first time we had a call that 50 dropped from in the selection. So the call uh, between us internally is, are we among the 50 or we are still in? They said, no, you are still in. Said, Fine, thank you so much. So, you know, uh, less uh, of a competition now. After, again, a few months, the call came in, another 20 dropped. Guys, are we among the 20 or we are still in? No, guys, you are still in. Until it came to the last three. When it came to the last three, I told my friends, look, if we uh, do not win it, I think we should be proud by getting selected up to the number three for two license only. Two license for three now. So uh, we were competing with the Norwegians, correct me if I am wrong, and the French and us. So I, I remember the day that the decision has to be made. I was in Doha airport, the new airport. Just prior to the opening, we were going and inspecting the airport and I was with the team and the call came in and they said, guys, you might not get it. Why? They said, you know, this is, uh, you know, I I'm sorry to say it, but it's coming from the Middle East and we don't want to have any, uh, any bother here, uh, no, you know, ethnic or whatever, we, so we don't want, uh, so I, I remember I gave a call to, to the uh, American ambassador here, uh, she's a friend of mine still, uh, and I told her, you know, the situation, and if she can, uh, she can help, she said, well, it's too late now. But again, we just said, you know, we'll leave it. I remember next morning at seven o'clock, uh, I was in my office, the call came from Myanmar that we won the second license. So the first one went to the Norwegian, second one went to Oridu, and I was extremely, extremely happy. And I remember, when we got it, we, the, it is under one condition that number three is trailing and waiting for you. If you miss one item, one item, you will be taken away. Whatever money you uh, spend or you invest, it's gonna go. So really, it was up on us to work around the clock, not only to achieve the minimum they asked for, but we really beat it all the, uh, the uh, KPIs and, 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 uh, uh, and uh, you know, uh, numbers they gave us. And we were even launching the service even before the date were given to us. And I was very proud of that. Now, someone, of, um, someone might say, fine, you know, you talk about, uh, uh, about uh, acquisition and you talk about uh, uh, you know, um, getting you know, uh, you know, uh, hard in the competition. What is the result? Show us the result. I will show it to you in those three slides. Look at the year 2000. In the year 2000, our uh, customer were what, 400? By 2006, we went to 2 million, 400 percent. By the year 2017, we are 150 plus million now, which brings it to 7,400 percent. By the way, every time we go to our meetings and they talk about expansion or they talk about growth, they tell us from the beginning, please do not show your uh, slides because we hate it. We don't want to see the slide. We talk about three and five, six percent. You guys are talking in the hundreds, so please don't show it. So if we talk about revenue, look at the year 2000, 1.3, 2006, 238, let's say 240 percent, 4.4 billion. By the year 2016, 32 billion, 600 plus percent increase. You have something else more? Well, in the profit, again, you know, you can talk, talk about, uh, uh, you know, revenue, you talk about uh, customers, but what is, the, what is the profit? Are you getting me a profit or, or not? You could see from the figures around you, 127 and 67%. So if someone talks about success, let him see those. So, experience is also what allowed Qatar successfully deal with the blockade. Qatar is under a blockade, but you notice a limited impact of the blockade on our daily lives. Supermarkets, shelves are full, business as usual, Qatar Airways is flying. 
but the blockade is being felt in traveling to those neighboring countries. We have been blocked from entering their airspace, territorial uh, water, and they limited our access to the banking system. It is very serious. They stopped us or stopped our access to their banking. No credit lines. It's all canceled. As you have heard from the media, Qatar Central Bank and the QIA had to intervene to support Qatar's banking system. It was a truly serious matter. So, what is banking system? In a simple nutshell, QIA invests in so many banks. We have large stakes in a number of them. We have Barclays, Credit Suisse, Santander, and many more in Qatar and outside Qatar. The role of the bank is to keep deposit from customers who wants their money to be safe, earn some returns, be available at any time, and could be withdrawn at any moment notice. On the other side of the equation, banks make loan to customers who want to pay as little as possible, keep the money as long as possible, and pay it back according to a preset schedule, not when the bank wants it. So you could see there is, a, there is an imbalance in the society that the banks is trying to bridge. And that's their business opportunity. This is exactly what, uh, why it doesn't take you much to put pressure on a bank. Imagine what will happen if just 5% of the customers one day suddenly decide they want to take their money out. That's what we call a run on the bank. And it happens when the news or rumors spread about the bank, that this bank is under trouble. They worry that their money is no longer safe there. So, but the customers taking that money, not take it to their home under the pillow, they, get, they take it to other bank. They keep it in the banking system. So the other banks now have excess cash that they must lend to earn interest on. This is where the banking system works. It protects against a bank run. Credit lines are established among banks and the central bank. These credit lines are like short-term loans. When banks experience a high demand for cash withdrawal, it borrows from the other banks and from the central bank. When foreign depositors started taking their money out of the Qatari banks and access to the Gulf banking system was stopped and wasn't available, QIA intervened with the, uh, with the central bank by moving funds from overseas into our banking system in Qatar. QIA provided cash to offset the withdrawal of the, of the deposit and the cancellation of the credit lines. Qatar has been able to successfully deal with the blockade with minimal impact on our daily life. So what is success? Let's look at the ingredient of the success. You have to have a clear vision of what, what you want to achieve and where you want to reach. An honest assessment of ability, strength, and weaknesses. A deep understanding of opportunities, risk, and how the environment is, is likely to evolve with that. A strategy that matches your strength and compensate for your weaknesses and deals with the risk. Now let me tell you why all that happened. Why you did not feel the blockade. I served in one of the board, which I'm not gonna mention. In this board, since 2005, we've been talking about what if. What if the blockade of 2015 go bigger? What if the banking system for some reason or whatever. What if the airways is blocked? Everything taken into, into account. We went over and over and over it again and again. We checked and rechecked all the ministers or all the, uh, or the organizations. They were all involved. We were working very close with each other. We, we were supporting each other 
for this moment. That's why you guys, you did not feel the, 2000, the 2017 blockade. It just went smoothly without any notice, without any notice. So if the QIA and the central banks played a big role in this, so you are asking me a question now, who is QIA? We are the Qatar Sovereign Wealth Fund. Our mandate is to invest and manage the funds of the state reserve. There are many reasons for this reserve. For future generation after the oil and gas, for the national development, all the uh, companies that we have uh, nationally, our, uh, the liquidity management in the country, and for any emergency need. What does that all mean? It means that QIA's responsibility is to protect the value of the reserve from inflation by investing them wisely. Now, you see some of QIA's investment capture the headlines in, in the media. But there are, this is only the visible part. Much of what we does does not really appear in the news. When Qatar needed uh, QIA to intervene after the blockade, it wasn't our beautiful skyscraper like the London Shard building or the New York Empire State Building that helped, nor the VW uh, position or Credit Suisse, our large holding, or our jewel building, Harrods, the department store, which I enjoy uh, being the chairman of, of that. By the way, in the States, whenever they know that I'm a chairman of Harrods, they don't care about the rest of all, you know, boards I mean. They are just interested on Harrods. It wasn't, it wasn't, uh, the, the, as I said, you know, Harrods or, or, or the Empire State or any of the uh, assets that we have. It was a boring, highly liquid, low volatility investment in a global uh, treasury and indexes. Okay, what comes after success? You succeed, then what? You enjoy the fruit of your success. There are financial benefits, yes, but it's what happened inside you that matters. You feel good about yourself, that you have accomplished something that not everyone can accomplish. It is a feeling of satisfaction and self-fulfillment. This is why, this is when you too should start thinking about sharing the fruit of your success. At Uridu, giving back is our core belief. We have committed ourselves to the advancing nine of the 17 United Nations Global Sustainable Development Goals. And I think it is here. Can you go back? Can you go back? Can you go back? This is the 17 uh, initiatives. Slide forward. And we have the nine of them. Now, out from that, uh, those nine, we, we run in all our companies, so many of them, so many initiatives, either here in Qatar or in, in any country, even in Kuwait, in Algeria, Tunisia, you name it, in the Maldives, whatever, you name them. But I will pick only three, which I, I feel it's really need to be touched. In Qatar, Uridu organized a sport in the health sector. Let's take the health sector now for a, for a while. In Qatar, Uridu organized a sport and health initiative across the country. We've done this with Aspire, with, with almost every organization here with program designed to encourage a healthy lifestyles for all. Initiatives including Uridu Marathon, by the way, which is every year in January. I hope I see some of you there because I do run the marathon. Community activities for Qatar National Day, the FINA Airwaves, uh, the Swimming Pool World Cup, the Dialysis Center here in Qatar, and in Indonesia, the Mobile Clinic with Leo Messi Foundation. And in in the Maldives also with the uh, mobile clinic between the islands. In gender, I'll tell a story here and it's true and Dr. Nasser can share this with me. During the war or after the war in Iraq, what happened in, the, in, the, uh, in Iraq that we noticed that there is no women approaching 
the company and, and purchasing a uh, mobile uh, services. And that's why I was selected to be in the gender board of the United Nations. And now uh, Dr. Nasser is taking that uh, from me after uh, being in, the, in, you know, in QIA, I'm very busy. So, you know, the question came from one of the staff, you know, why there is no women's, you know, purchasing uh, service. And after a survey, we discovered that there is, you know, problems in the country, unrest in the country. Uh, especially the, uh, the guy will say to his family, do not leave the house, don't go. So there is a miss of communication, even between the family and the father, if he's out. What if ha something happened to him? No communication. So again, we found that the women really do not go to the places where it is full of people. So we had to come with, with an initiative. And we created a line called Almas. We knew, we knew the women's like uh, the diamond, so we called it Almas. So we called it Almas and we said you know, to the uh, women, you know, we will bring you the service to your home. We will uh, create a service customized only for you only for what you, uh, what you need. So you do not get harassed, you do not get a uh, call from outside the family uh, group. So we can customize a service just for you and for your family. And then the father or the family started to realize that this is a good service, why not? And then in less than a year, we got three million women into our network. Now, to this, service is um, going to be uh, nominated uh, for the uh, GSMA Global Award, which I'm truly, truly proud to see this is happening. Now, when it comes to innovation, this is another area where we are really uh, doing good work uh, on. In Indonesia, to, de to develop education and innovation, Indusat Uridu, has been encouraging the, uh, to educate the young people through the Indosat Uridu Wireless Innovation Center, the IWIC, since 2006. The program aims to create a pool of digital talent in the country and nurture a future technopreneur. In 2016, IWIC opened the contest for international uh, competitor, attracting more than 3,500 young talents, 750 female entrants. Now, let me tell you, the best return on investment comes from the investment you make when you give back. Here again, I would like to give a true story. I remember we were traveling to Indonesia for a board meeting, and then the earthquake happened in Morabi. We were told not to come. It is not safe. So we had to travel. We did our board. And we said, we would like to travel to the area. They said, no, you can't. So I said, we need to, uh, to help. They said, you can only help, but you can't go. So we started by asking the CEO, Alex. He's, he is the guy you need to be beside you whenever there is, a, uh, there is a problem. So he stepped in and he said, we will do whatever it takes to help those people. So we started sending generators, water, fresh water. And we started working with them around the clock until the dust settled. Then we said, okay, what is next? We just can't let them and go. We discovered that there is one entire village just wiped out. So we decided to go and build that village again and build it in a, in a, in a, in a real hygienic uh, environment. So what we did, we really worked around the clock, created the village, gave the village to the Poor people there. Uh, I remember our late ambassador, I know, uh, may God uh, bless, bless him. Uh, he was with me. And uh, we built the whole village with a clinic, with a school. And I can tell you, this is the moment that you feel proud of yourself. Not only about the, the uh, graphs you've seen before. So, in conclusion, how is all this related to you? I hope you picked up on the lesson, experience yield knowledge. Knowledge yield success. Your success depends on the more you learn, the more your experience, 
the bigger your success. Our predecessors have contributed their life's hard work to, 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 to today's body of a human knowledge. As we are approaching one of our most important national days in years, we should be grateful to our predecessors and the leadership of His Highness Sheikh Tamim, His Highness the Father Sheikh Hamad, and his deputy, Sheikh Abdullah, who, by the way, the chairman of QIA, and he's also a graduate from this school. So show your gratitude by giving back. If you remember just this one thing from what you heard from me today, and you act on it, you will be remembered as a great person. Thank you. Ready for your questions. Well, thank you very much, you. Uh, Excellency. Um, in, in some ways, it r reflects some of the themes that also emerged from His Excellency Sheikh uh, uh, in, um, Abdullah Latia last, uh, last week. Um, experience, risk, and so on. But a tremendous story, and I'm, I'm very particularly uh, happy about your personal, very personal stories that came through. Um, a few questions to start, uh, start us off with, perhaps, perhaps. And then, as I said earlier, please, you know, get your brain cells working if they're not already in high gear and come up with questions yourselves. The, f the first one perhaps on Uridu itself. One of the striking things that also came, became clear from your presentation, Uridu is one of those companies from Qatar and in the Gulf that shown it's possible for companies from here to become globally competitive. But it still remains in, in a minority, arguably, of companies from Qatar and the Gulf who operate at that level. Do you think it is possible, it is likely that we're going to see a growth in those truly globally competitive companies from Qatar and the region? Thank you for this question. Actually, let me say that if there are two companies that really worked well and became a flagship of Qatar was Uridu and QMB, Qatar National Bank. And I'm proud to say Mishkurullah. And I'm proud to say that this was not an initiative just came just like that. It, it went, as I said, through very hard debates at Uridu board. I remember when we started talking about it, even some people in the government at that time, they said, you know, you guys, you are hardly running a, con a company here in, in Doha. Everybody's complaining about your service, about your prices, and you think you, you are going to go and, you know, uh, be a company or a global company. And uh, so we went to the board and we started discussing this in the board and once, twice, 10 times, and we killed it. We killed it, uh, you know, uh, uh, thoroughly studying the, the pros and cons in this. In the end, the decision came, yeah, why not? Let's go, you know, if there is a, a, a company in our neighboring countries doing so, why not? We had the capability, we have at that time Still, we had the money to, to do that, you know, uh, and it worked. I remember the first time we went, I think, to Oman. Oman. The first one was to Oman. And I remember when we went there, we went just only five people meeting in the lobby in the hotel. We didn't know how to do it. We didn't know how to acquire a company. And I remember we used to gather, you know, uh, information. And then someone will say, okay, excuse me, I call a friend in Switzerland, or I call a friend in Norway, or a friend in London, and I will get some information, how, how we do it. And this is how, actually, we've, we've done it. And, and it worked. So it's the first time we decided to, to go out, and we, uh, we got it. So it became like, uh, we became uh, greedy. We said, fine, you know, why not? Uh, let's go. And we, second time, we were going to Egypt, which did not work because it went out outside the para uh, parameters we put. But uh, again, as I said, through a different plan, we went into Indonesia. We went through a company. We knew that it's, gonna, it's not going to work, and we can fix it, and we did. So uh, this is how it evolved, similar to with Q uh, QMB, Qatar National Bank. It was only the board and the team that started thinking about expansion and going outside. And, Became, became you know, uh, global and well known. But again, you know, if if you want to run a company that it goes internationally and succeed, you have to have a proper governance. You have to have a strategy. As I said in the beginning, now for most of uh, the kids here, they will walk out one day from the school. They have to have a strategy. What are they going to do in life? 
what do they want? Let's say they joined QIA or joined Rido or joined minister, ministry uh, in the government. They have to have a strategy. Without a strategy, without knowing what's your strategy, you will not work. As I said, 2015, it was a, a big lesson. Maybe for some, some, you know, it's just passed. 2015, pull the ambassadors, you know, things became fine, shake hands, and that's it. But for us, it wasn't. For us, it was a signal. We have to work on that and be uh, more vigilant and should not depend and be naive, maybe. I, 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 could, I could say, I could use this word, naive, by, you know, de being dependent on, you know, uh, you know, on, on, on few speculation. So this is how we built. Now in QIA, what we are trying to do? Since I joined 2015, we started to collect all the national companies, bring them on, the, uh, on board with a new strategy. We dedicated, uh, you know, a, a team for that. We have a head of uh, the local uh, champions. What, what's our strategy is really to bring them in, uh, help them on become uh, a global company we have Katara. Katara is one of the finest and, 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 and successful brand for Qatar. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, you know, I was in Milan a few months ago and I was extremely delighted to enter a, you know, a room called Katara. I, I knew uh, the, the quality of work they are doing in London, in, in, uh, in the States, in uh, Paris. So Katara would be the uh, new champion that we are working on and it's going to be uh, IPO sometimes in the future. Mm -hmm. Qatar Airways, one of the successful companies that we are, we should be proud of it. Qatar Airways played a huge role during the blockade. Maybe people do not realize this. Guys, you know, we've moved mountains during the, uh, during the blockade. Qatar Airways played a big role. Qatar Airways in the last few months uh, bought uh, the uh, Italian company. They bought last uh, couple of weeks ago a big stake in, in, uh, in Cathay Pacific, one of the prestigious uh, companies. So this is another champions we are looking to, to see in the future. Also, DR is another company that we will work uh, you know, with very closely so that to create another flagship for Qatar. Mm -hmm. So this is how QIA will play a role from now on, on for the national uh, companies in Qatar. I hope I answered this question. Absolutely. Um, if you uh, allow me, and if we switch to uh, QIA, could you say something about um, the extent to which um, QIA's international investment strategy has evolved, has changed um, over the past few years? And perhaps also what role it's played in the current blockade? Okay. Well, QIA, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, a young, uh, you know, entity. Mm. It was only, I think, 10, 11 years ago mm. since the creation of QIA. It was 2005. So, uh, really, you know, if you think about it, still a young uh, entity, but played a huge role during the 2008 and 9 and 10 during the financial crisis. Mm -hmm. Again, here comes the leadership and the strategy. I think, you know, the leadership, or not I think, I'm sure, the leadership played a huge role by really understanding what is the issue here. And what they did, they just went and got as much as they could, grabbing the best companies, blue chip in the world, and bringing it in, uh, on board and they created the, really the base of QIA. Then 2015, things became different and, and the strategy has to evolve differently. So, uh, you know, His Highness Sheikh Abdullah, when he came, became the chairman of QIA, uh, he started thinking, fine, you know, we went through the accumulation uh, bit, we did, you know, what we could do, but now let's do it, uh, you know, uh, and institu institu institutionally. So what we did, we went through a, a proper strategy that the board approved to divest, uh, you know, divest from huge positions, to uh, reallocate to, um, you know, so that you uh, uh, manage, uh, you know, uh, the, the portfolio uh, pretty well. Uh, div diversification in geography, in asset class, all this were part and parcel of the, of the uh, new, um, uh, of the new strategy, which is working fine. One of them, as I said, is allocating asset class that it could help either when, when the crisis happens, like now, or when there are opportunities that you would like to grab and you move your liquidity into uh, uh, places from one area to another. And, and 
I think there will be a question, I'm sure there will be a question uh, about the investment, which I will answer, and I don't want to include it in this, uh, in this uh, uh, well, question. Per perhaps you've, you've read my mind, because uh, no many people will know about QIA through, um, because of its international presence, its international investments, and all these, the, the big buildings, but also companies and so on. But you also have very significant national assets here. What is the strategy? What is the thinking about that? Are you thinking about putting it on the market and or listing it, or what is the thinking? Of course, you know, uh, as I said, you know, the, uh, we are now uh, forming. Well, we did actually. We did form the strategy for the local uh, or for the national assets. As I said, you know, like uh, Qatar, Qatar Airways, and uh, QMB, and many more QSI, uh, the sport, uh, you know, uh, company. So many of them they are coming in, on board, and we are trying now to form a strategy for them internally, so that they uh, match with the strategy of QIA, and how can they, how can they, uh, you know, uh, implement our, uh, you know, uh, our strategy on them. Uh, with that, we will be supporting them financially. We will support them, uh, you know, uh, in the organization, uh, human capitals, whatever they want. We've been taking uh, at least. 10 grad from uh, Qatar Foundation every year, either from here or Carnegie, and uh, we adapt them into our uh, you know, uh, company, and with those people, they should now drive those national assets for the future. We will set the seed for them and let them uh, go for it. And is there any, any thought of, of course, listing? Of course, uh, Qatar is gonna be one. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure Qatar is you know, coming in the pipeline. After that, uh, could be the Qatar Airways. We are not. Uh, we are trying to hold them uh, a bit until they just, you know, create a, a good portfolio before they just uh, go into the uh, into the IPO. Because we think that uh, they will be valued more if they, uh, you know, uh, finish their strategy. Mm -hmm. So those are the two companies we see them in the in the uh, radar uh, from now until uh, Thank you. medium t term, let's say. So maybe one, one final question from me, and then I'm sure you're all aching to start asking your own questions. Um, in the, the sovereign wealth fund world, there's been, for many years, there's been this ebb and, ebb and flow of discussion about transparency and all kinds of sets of rules. And so I just wondered, particularly since you're also on the, the board of this sovereign wealth fund in, institution, um, what, what the thinking in, in Qatar, in QIA, is what the position is that Qatar is, is adopting there? Well, uh, I, can, I can't uh, you know, hide this away from you. Yes, in the, in, uh, we are trying, like in the Sovereign World Fund, they are trying to keep the information as, as close as possible because some of them are in a growing mode. Mm -hmm. Some of them are uh, trying to be uh, s you know, sustainable and they want just to keep it for a while until they know what is, uh, what is the future uh, impact. The other thing is uh, we, are adapt, uh, adopting the, um, uh, the, um, uh, the Sovereign Wealth Fund uh, rules and regulation. Of course, uh, since we came in, we, uh, you know, I, became, I joined them mm -hmm. uh, you know, voluntarily. I said, I, I would like to join so that we can learn from you and how can we uh, start implementing your uh, uh, you know, ideas. And now we are gradually bringing in you know, more transparency into the system. Also, we are in the COP21, if I'm not mistaken, it's happening in Paris. We are gonna come up with a, with a paper that we are gonna sign with any sovereign wealth fund that w would like to join, so that you know, we can be also supported, not only mm -hmm. uh, in, in a very tra in a transparent mode, but also environmentally. Do we really invest uh, in, in things that harms the, the environment or harms uh, the people or uh, is it uh, arms? It's what, what? So we need to be, uh, to put it into a frame that you know, sovereign wealth fund should really work on the, uh, you know, have a ethics on, 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 uh, on invest, investment. Thank you. So um, His Excellency has said he'd, he'd very much like to organize, moderate the, the rest of the Q&A himself. So over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Your Excellency. Um, very nice slides as well. You can obviously tell it's been prepared by the Uridu team, not the QIA team. <laughs> uh, thank you for your time. Very informative. Uh, 
I just want to, I have two questions. One, I'll set it up and then I'll ask the second question is straightforward. Um, so the first question is, we say you're probably one of the people in, in the room who knows the most about the contribution of oil, the oil and gas sector to Qatar's economy. You know how big the contribution is to the government's revenue. It's massive. And uh, we talk a lot about uh, a knowledge-based economy. We're trying to move into a knowledge-based economy, which is great. But what's the next step that we need to take is to say, right, but what do we mean by that? Like, What sector exactly are we talking about when we say knowledge-based economy? That's not enough, for me at least. I need to know um, in the next 40, 50, 60, 100 years when oil gets depleted, oil and gas, because it's a depletable resource, what sector will come in to offset that? What is that sector exactly? And, and wh what is, uh, I want to know your opinion. There might not be a right answer right now. Uh, what, is, what do you think Qatar has in terms of, do we have a natural advantage in a certain sector? Or is there something that no one else can do that Qatar can capitalize on? So what could be that sector? For example, if it's a, a technology hub that we want to be in the world, we need to address it now, and we need to start revamping the system. Even the education system, the social system, we need to, that, that will yield more programmers, more engineers, IT engineers. Uh, and so that's the first question, clear? Okay. Okay, the second question is, uh, I wanted to know your views on, on the Bitcoin craze that everybody's been on. Uh, some, uh, your kind of um, serious views because um, it's getting too hot and I know a lot of, personally, a lot of friends who are getting into this uh, blindly. Um, yesterday it reached 10,000, we know, and I just checked, it's 11,000 right now. So you might want to say a few things and if, if QIA is actually looking into cryptocurrency or not. Yeah, so thank are, you very we are, much. We are looking to stay away from it. <laughs> Please, have a seat. That's good. <laughs> no, look, let me answer the second question first. Bitcoin. <laughs> look, this, what, what's happening here is I'm sure, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's speculation. Stay away from it. It's becoming now frightening. Now the whole world is talking about what's going on. You know, you can't have something, you know, at 3,000 and a month later at 10,000. That's ridiculous. You know, so that, that's uh, smell fishy. You know, if it smells like a duck, talks like a duck, it is a duck. So stay away from it, please. That's number one. Number two, let me tell you about the, the uh, Qatar vision on, on, on uh, you know, knowledge-based society. Actually, as I said, it's, it's four pillars, and they are all has to work together. And uh, being as, uh, as uh, you know, the professor just mentioned and said that I am a board member of the Supreme Council. This is an, uh, an item on our agenda every meeting. We talk about social, what we are doing in the social uh, element of it. We are talking about environmental, we talk about the economy, and every uh, person responsible for that sector has to put his input. If it is one person or two or two entities or whatever, so everybody has to put their, uh, their uh, you know, input in it. And then uh, decision comes and, and plans comes uh, along with it. That's number one. Number two, when we say, you know, when you tell me, you know, what are we gonna benefit out? You will benefit a lot. Let me just tell you, in the technology side, just the technology part of it, if we adopt the technology side bit of it, we will save a lot, billions of, uh, of money. In each sector you talk about. Let's talk about, for instance, construction. And instead of having 4,000 or 5,000 in each company that do a, 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 you know, a low labor, you can, with the technology you don't need all that amount. I'll, I'll tell you, uh, a true story. I was in Paris uh, a few months ago, and a, a friend of mine called me. He said, "You know, come and see my apartment." And I went to see his apartment. It was still, you know, uh, lots of mess. And I said, "Who's doing the work?" He said, "Those two people." And I said, "How come two people? You know, does all this work?" They said, he said, "Yeah." And when I looked through the window, which I had to be very careful not to <laughs> not to fall, I saw a small, uh, you know, machine that it does everything for them. It brings everything up by remote control. And the two is just doing the, the job. So, you know, with technology, you can add, add a lot into, into, uh, into this. Also, when you say, what is the reserve? Where, where are the reserves? 
we have a depleted uh, or a depleting uh, you know, uh, resources like the oil and gas. So what are we planning for? This is actually why QIA is here. QIA is being made really to be the future generation. As I said in my speech, it's one of the element or it's the main, the main pillar for, our, for QIA is to be the future gener for the future generation. His Highness always said it, and even His Highness the Chairman always say it. Look, guys, by the year 2030, we want QIA to be self-sustained, do not take money from the government, and if it is required, the government required money from them, we need the QIA to be stable. So really, all the resources that the government puts into QIA has to be invested. Now you tell me, do you invest it wisely? Well, we have the best talented people in the world in QIA working for us. And, and we work with institutions around the world. Uh, we are in the move all the time. You know, uh, I hardly find my even friends in the same, uh, in the same uh, you know, floor with me uh, to see them. So we are always traveling. Uh, we are always meet, meeting uh, you know, um, uh, companies, partners, funds, managers, and we work with them. We've, we've done massive since 2015 until now. You know, the, numbers of, uh, the number that we invested in the last three, four months is huge. And the payback, we see it even every year from, through dividends, through you know, the liquidation of, uh, or uh, I mean divestment into some of the funds. And, that is how uh, the investment works. We work in short term, we work for a long term, and some of the companies that we uh, own uh, position on, on, it's dual. You know, whatever happens that you would like to keep them forever if you can. So, you know, this is the essence of QIA and the, uh, the, the uh, you know, uh, role of QIA is really to be the future, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, oil and gas of Qatar, if I can put it this way. Thank you, Your Excellency, for your time today. It's always a pleasure hearing you speak. Uh, I just want to ask a question. I think you've successfully shown Redo Group's uh, expansion and the, how the profitability and revenue was able to increase. Uh, but do you believe within the Qatar market there's enough scope for two fully-fledged carriers uh, and profitability within that? Uh, we're speaking about Vodafone, obviously. And a second question, just uh, along the lines of the theme of today's lecture. Um, with, with the lack of a unified GCC, where do country firms, which markets, I think since you're the most experienced business person in this room, which market should they be looking for? As in, yesterday there was a commerce agreement between Iran, Turkey, and Qatar as well, but uh, your personal recommendation, which markets should country firms be looking for outside of the GCC? If you ask uh, me a question, you know, will the two companies, uh, you know, work in Qatar? Yes, you know, uh, uh, let me just tell you, part of s some of the good work we've done because of the competition. We were maybe a bit lazy in the past, but you know, with the competition, we started to work around uh, all those uh, you know challenges. So uh, I am a believer of competition. So this is this is for sure, and and we hope we have a, a constant dialogue with our uh, peers in Vodafone. And whenever we have an issues, we take their support. If they have issues, like what they've done, what they had a couple of months ago, we were there to support. So. Really, when we talk, we talk about Qatar here. We are not only talking about two companies. Yes, uh, challenges are there. Uh, the, uh, you know, uh, we compete, yes, but in the end, uh, this is how market. Uh, for Qatar and, 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 and you know, uh, the absence of GCC, you know, I need to be very careful here not to cross the line. But, but I'll, I'll, I'll talk about my, my thinking. I think you know what we had is a sort of a wake-up call. I think we we were thinking that yes, if we needed something, we can get it from here and there. Uh, if uh, the company, if the factory is here, why do I replicate? So you know, let them invest in somewhere else, you know, and, and get the benefit. I think this is a sort of a wake-up call for us. I think it's a good. Uh, the plan we've done since 2015 worked, worked perfectly well, and uh, I say that with full confidence. And, uh, and I, I'm a, uh, I believe that now the markets are, it's not, not anymore uh, only the GCC. It has to be now, we have to look into a bigger scale. We have to look into Asia. We have to look into Europe. By the way, we were, you know, trading with 280 companies or country around the world. 
of 230 around the world. So what is if three or four drops? You, you understand? Uh, uh, the, 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 their weight in our balance sheet is what? 15, 16%? So what? Uh, this is how, you know, this is the message I'm trying to, to get. I'm, I'm not trying, I will not go deeper than this. But what I'm saying, we are fine. We are fine. Things are working perfectly well. Plans, and there will be more plans to come. And I'm proud to say that, uh, you know, uh, extremely happy of what we've done uh, since the blockade until today. Especially in the banking system. In the banking system, it was simple. You take my money from here, I bring mon my money from, uh, from your banks, and I will put it here. What is, uh, so, uh, so what? Uh, you know, there is always an answer to, to the question. If they think that they can inflict uh, damage uh, to Qatar, I think they are mistaken. If they lose one dollar, if we lose one dollar, they will lose one. Simple. And, and uh, okay, I'll, I'll stop here. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Sheikh Abdullah, for your talk. Um, I'm Faisal Mir. I'm from Carnegie Mellon University. Um, you mentioned about um, how QIA injected billions of dollars into the Qatari banking sector after the blockade um, to mitigate liquidity issues. Um, but if we go back a year and a half or two years ago, after the oil crisis, um, the Ministry of Finance decided against calling on QIA and actually borrowed money to fill the deficit. Um, two questions. First, what was the difference this time around? And second, how does this impact QI's long-term investment strategy moving forward? Uh, I think you're uh, referring uh, b back to the uh, bond that uh, Qatar uh, raised, uh, you know, during uh, during that period. That's nothing to do with the QIA. Uh, QIA, in the in the meantime, while you are saying that you know they went and borrowed, it's just part of the equation in the economy that they they have to. Uh, uh, with the oil prices dropped to uh, around what, from 120 to about 40 or, or so, they needed uh, to raise uh, capital, fine with them. But for us as uh, QIA, we kept investing 2015, 2016, 2017. Today, today, this morning at 11 o'clock, we signed a big check for, for a deal. Two weeks ago, we signed one of the biggest check we've done in the last two years. As I said, you may not hear uh, about it. We, our work continues. Nothing to do with the, with the Minister of Finance. Uh, his Minister of Finance, whenever he has access of money, he just uh, access of money, he say, okay, you take it, you invest it. Whenever he thinks that he, he needed the money, he will keep it for himself, but I will keep going. I have my own resources. I am always investing and divesting and changing my strategy. And as, as as a fund manager, this is my role. My role is to capture uh, the opportunities. Maybe sometimes you hear that QIA uh, divested from, let's say, Tiffany. This is the one came on the, on the news uh, a month and a half ago. Would it come into your mind that I have 13%, if I go 3%, that's because of blockade? Nonsense. This is part of my management of the portfolio. If I, if I was in need of cash, it was at its highest in the last six years, Tiffany. I could have sold it all if I was in need of money, but it wasn't. I needed just to divest and bring the portfolio to its limit. I should not overshoot my limit or the limits has been set by the board. So this is part of the investment. We sell, we, we buy. And people, sometimes they think that well, with the blockade, don't sell because we don't want to go in the, in the, in the media because they say they are selling because they, they are in need of cash. I am against that. This is part of the business that we do under the blockade or without it. So, no, we are not in need of cash from the government. Uh, if, they are, if they want to stop it for some reason, whatever, for projects of the 2022 or what, whatever, but we still can go. We have we have enough to continue uh, our work. As I said, this morning only, this morning, we've done remarkably well in, in one of the investments we decided on. I By know the way, we've, been, we've, we've, been trying, we've been trying for almost a month on that, and it worked. I think in the back. You should probably, you should probably make this the final question, because I know you've been standing on your feet for a long time now. And it's, I'm, all yours, today. I'm all yours today. I'm all yours today. One, it was one, Yes, sir, here. And, okay, maybe if you could both ask your questions very briefly, 
and then مم خليك مم خليك باجيك باجيك أشوفك ترفع يدك من المساعد please as smoothly as possible and as silently as possible. As I said, most of our business is silent. We are, we are in a silent mode. We do not... <laughs> we played a big role. We, uh, we as a, a QIA and a Qatar Central Bank, I must say that he's, he did remarkably well. Uh, well, uh, let me say that nobody needed our... Uh, our uh, uh, you know, intervention except the banking system. And as I said in the beginning, as a blockade itself, you did not notice anything. So, we, you know, we tried to eliminate all those issues earlier on from 2015. We worked around all scenarios. So, we, the, you know, you did not really feel the blockade as a feel of the blockade. But uh, us as a QIA, we really helped our companies, our national uh, companies here in Qatar, so you know, I, I won't let them down. So you know, we did, and the central bank did uh, help a lot. Uh, I must, you know, uh, say to him, you know, thank you for what he did, and uh, and we are both, uh, you know, in the support of uh, of the market. But we did pretty good job. Salam alaikum. Thank, thank you, sir. Muhammad, for this thank excellent you. presentation. I have one question. So uh, this has been touched on previously regarding transparency. Don't you think having uh, more disclosure from QIA w and more sc public scrutiny on uh, uh, the management of assets, uh, it will help QIA ha have a better, a better <coughs> performance in the future? Also, you mentioned uh, uh, compliance to the Santiago principles just uh, a few minutes earlier. So don't you th think more compliance to the Santiago pr principles will also help us in uh, better managing our fund? Absolutely, absolutely. By the way, uh, the, uh, the board is, uh, is not keeping quiet. They are really putting us under pressure. So they, you know, don't uh, think that we are uh, you know, the decision maker. No one is really, uh, uh, how do I say, uh, uh, check on us what we, what we do and what we uh, don't do. Uh, we have uh, one of the big four that really comes in and check uh, our uh, performance, check our uh, uh, documents, and uh, if it is according to the international standard or not. So we are. So the moment they tell us, you know, be more uh, open, we are ready from day one. So if all our documentation is there. We are in the program. As I said, we are, uh, you know, a young uh, entity 10 years ago. Uh, so the first five, six, seven years, it was the buildup of the, of the institution. So people are not really thinking of what is Santiago principle or what is the uh, rules and regulation on investment, uh, what is partnership. So it was more or less, you know, just acquire as much as you could, pile as much as you could, take the opportunity of the, uh, uh, of the, down, down, uh, the market, market crisis and the financial, of course, the financial. So after that, as I said, you know, from 2015 and 14, the idea came up, okay, now we have a big portfolio. How do we carry on? Are we just gonna just pile more and more or it's gonna be um, uh, through, you know, a proper way of, of thinking uh, in, the, in the investment side, uh, the, um, uh, the, the scrutiny of investment and how, at what basis you go and, uh, you know, invest in what sectors, what are the sectors that it, it has the growth, what sector does not, uh, you know, all this, it, it is, it is part of the daily work we do. Uh, you know, I, I must tell you, you know, I, I see some of the QIA, uh, you know, some of them are head of the portfolios, if I'm not mistaken. So they do a lot of work, uh, you know, to keep balancing their portfolio, divesting, investing, and they have a benchmark. At the end of the year, like now, I think, huh? in the next one month or two, they will be, uh, they will come and say, you know, uh, what's our uh, performance? You know, what did we do? So, you know, they know what's their benchmark. They know what KPIs they, uh, they have to reach. It's very simple. It's one plus one. So it is uh, no, no female question? Okay, you. Fadal. Asma'ak. Uh, 
Uh, first of all, Your Excellency, I would like to thank you for a great presentation. Um, my question uh, was a follow-up actually to the first question um, regarding, um, well, how we see QIA as uh, our country's tool to be independent from uh, the oil and gas uh, sector, if you wish. And um, so my question is specifically, when do we see that happening? When and how close uh, are we to achieving this kind of uh, vision? Because yeah, just like um, just like the gentleman said uh, earlier, um, it is uh, a source that will uh, perish eventually. So um, uh, when do we see this kind of thing happening? And how how does uh, QIA currently see itself in this progress? Like, how, what kind of progress have we made? Thank you so much. First of all, you know, uh, I must apologize for diverting you a bit from uh, QIA into Uridu in the, in, the, in the lecture. And the reason was, as I said, you know, I was uh, uh, in London when I got the call that Abdullah bin Hamad al-Atiyah was here. I knew that he just took the floor uh, from me and he gave all the information you needed and why I should come here and uh, talk about the same, uh, same thing. So, you know, I had... Seriously, I used the flight back from uh, London to just script around the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the lecture and I, my team just kept you know, calling me, you know, when you are gonna stop? And actually this morning, this actual morning at seven o'clock, I was uh, changing some, uh, some parts of it. So that I, may, I wanted to, to look more for you guys who was gonna graduate next year what does success mean? What, uh, what should, you, should you plan for your uh, future and your career and for your uh, life? And, and uh, I just wanted to touch base on true stories that I lived uh, you know, all uh, my career and, and that uh, as a, a lesson really uh, for, for um, some of you. For answering your question, uh, as I said, you know, we have a mandate from His Highness from the first day he told me, you know, you take charge, and the new board came in, and I sat with the board, and they, we met with his hands, and he said, look, 2030 is your deadline. Now, what I want you to do is to put 230 and work your uh, way down, and tell me, when you, uh, will you be able to do it or not? If you are able to do it, fine, go ahead and do it. If you are not able to do it, tell me why, and what is the resources that you need so that we can make 2030 is a reality. So we went, I think it took us three, four months. It wasn't a simple job. And we, may, we used all the resources internally. We did not bring anyone from outside because you wanted the people who lives the, the, uh, the, uh, the exercise, the work every day. They should uh, put the strategy, they should um, honor it and own it and manage it. So uh, we said, okay, guys, it's 2030. So this is 2030. We want it to be the oil and gas. So what is the revenue from oil and gas? So we just matched it and we said, okay, let's go uh, downward. Can we make it from today, uh, 2015? Then after, you know, a strategy, full of strategy, we came up with the, uh, you know, with the ideas and we said, you know, we need to fill gaps here and there. We need the quality of people of that uh, you know, caliber to come and fit here and there. And that's what we did from day one. We went and, you know, to the market, brought, as I said, you know, the finest people. And I can tell you, you know, I can, can bet on it also. We bet, brought the finest people in the, in the company and they are working with us you know, uh, perfectly well and uh, you know, the numbers and the results uh, speak uh, for itself. And I'm proud to be, uh, you know, a member of uh, QIA as much as uh, proud to be as a uh, chairman of uh, for you. Your Excellency, thank you very, very much. Uh, I know there will be more more questions, but oh no, do you? Uh, you did ask for a female question. Okay, okay. I shouldn't have uh, said something. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm, I, I apologize, I just didn't want the opportunity to go. Thank you so much, Your Excellency, for a very inspirational, very motivational talk. With that being said, I understand you played a very pivotal role with the World Bank, 
And I was hoping you could expand on uh, your experience with um, <coughs> women and children um, in the development field in general. Well, uh, I, uh, do you have time until the morning? <laughs> I can't talk from here until the morning. Look, there are uh, so many things we, we are proud uh, we've done, especially uh, in Uridu. Uh, you know, complying with the, or, or working around the 17 uh, United Nations Sustainable uh, Development Goals. That was an initiative. Really, we worked hard, very hard on it as a board and as a management. And I don't want really to take the credit myself. Dr. Nasser, he's a board member and he was the CEO and the group CEO. He, he did most of the work. And, and please, you know, uh, do not think that it's my job. It's not one man show. It is the, the, the team that worked really around all the success of Uridu uh, through the, 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 you know, the years. Well, we've done so much. I've I spoke about the health in, or the gender divide in, um, in Iraq. But let me tell you a few, uh, few uh, stories here. Uh, I remember some of the, uh, some of the uh, villages in Indonesia uh, they are. They don't have internet access. They can't even. Some uh, some of them. They just can't even charge their own mobile to keep communicating. Uh, some of the uh, villages. They do not have even a pharmacy because of uh, uh, the medicine. Uh, there's no refrigerators for medicine. So uh, for us as uh, Uridu, uh, the, those are one of the areas we played a big role by enhancing our stations, uh, mobile stations, by having, you know, sockets, uh, you know, for people to come and charge. A refrigerator for, you know, someone to be in charge of those, you know, medicine for the village. Uh, f uh, also in the banking sector, what we uh, told them, look, um, we will give you a scratch card. And those scratch cards, you sell it between yourselves. It's good for me because they really provide money for me, but in the same time, keeps them working, and they generate uh, a better money. And a story of one lady in one of the villages in Indonesia. She actually started working on scratch card. Then she said, look, guys, you know, could you introduce me to internet? So the team introduced her to internet, iPad, and then she started asking, can I you know, work with the families because they have relatives in the Middle East or somewhere and they would like to transfer money. Could we do through the, uh, you know, mobile money? And by, by uh, a year or so, she became a bank. She started to be the bank of that village working for, for her family. That's one. I remember in Indonesia also for the farmers, what happens that they, uh, you know, traders, they come in and they buy their products, they pay them peanuts. So, you know, people, they do, they, they do not know outside the world what, you know, how this commodity is, is being sold. So for us was to go and develop an, an applications for those farmers. Those applications tell them what is the product's value of the, in the market, how much they sell it, what is the market in, in neighboring countries, in other markets? So they started to work around this device. And this device created a new life for them. For them, it's a better, uh, a better uh, revenue. And also, the, the revenue that they deserve, not when they were used to be ripped for, for, uh, you know, for their work. The other thing is, uh, the last one, I'm not going to go, because I can go on and on, because I have a list of, uh, you know, of them, I, I had to delete them from the, uh, one, of the uh, uh, one of the areas that we have done is with Sherry Blair F F Foundation. She is the wife of the uh, previous prime minister uh, of uh, England. What we uh, started to do is really, there are so many ladies in, in, uh, in Indonesia that they do a lot of work and craft uh, dress, and they are in the villages. They do not know how to sell it. So what we uh, try to do is to, again, create an application for them and try to show them where they can sell their products. And not only that, but also we created an area for them 
where they can come in if they, have, uh, if, they, if they are willing to come, if they can leave their villages and come and work and sell their products from that area. And I remember we went and opened uh, that uh, facility and I can tell you, you know, there are almost 200 shops I saw you know, myself. And every time we do something like that and we walk out, really, we just feel you know, the satisfaction that you feel. It's not how much customers you have or how much money you got in the end of the, the year. It's how effective you were in the community. And is the community appreciating it or not? And I can tell you, you know, Indus, Indusat in Indonesia or uh, Uridu in Myanmar, or if you think about Algeria, Uridu, Algeria, Tunisia, wherever you go, Maldives, they, they just think that this is a company that they would like to attach themselves in, uh, with it. I remember in Maldives, I was on the boat going from the uh, resort, going to do the listing, and you know, where you go and knock the bell and you, know, you are listed in the market. And I, he doesn't know who, who am I. Uh, we were talking with him and uh, he started you know, ringing. I said, what, what network you are using? He said, Uridu. I said, why do you use Uridu? I said, well, very helpful to, to us in the, in the uh, community, in our village. You know, in either in the health or in education. Or, so this is the, makes you feel proud, you know, that this guy is not buying the service just because it's a service, but he feel attached uh, to, to this company. And this is when you really feel uh, proud of yourself. Last question, young fellow here, you would like to? He's a future Georgetown uh, student. Thank you, Your Excellency. So, uh, so I want to ask you one question. Did you face problems when you wanted to change the name of Qtil to Oridu? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs> uh, actually, it is, um, you know, changing the name of Qatar Telecom or Qtil. Uh, sort of an, uh, you know, very close to uh, any person's heart, you know, especially the Qataris. And they believe, you know, why do you change, uh, you know, the name into a, a name that, you know, might be not existing or not be relevant to us. And how, how dare you take a Qatar name from, uh, from uh, uh, Qtel? Uh, it's a brand by itself. It's fine if you are working here in Qatar let's say you are working in a neighboring countries here where we know each other and we are a family and we are. But when you think globally, <coughs> you just can't say, you know, I'm, I'm Qatar Telecom and you are, let's say, in Tunisia or in Myanmar or in Kuwait. And also unifying a brand is a more strength, gives you more strength, more muscles really to compete. Uh, and by changing the name or the brand, it was a huge exercise. I remember, uh, you know, we went through a list of names, and uh, I don't know if I should say it or not, but uh, I remember, you know, when we, um, when we shortlisted the three names, I went to His Highness, uh, the father, Sheikh Hamad, and, his, uh, you know, I always uh, feel grateful to this man, you know. I went to see him and I said to him, Your Highness, I'm thinking of changing the brand. He said, well, it was three years ago you changed the brand. I said, no, no, I changed the logo. I'm now changing the whole brand. You know, so it's a completely different story. Because you remember he opened actually uh, the, the, um, uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the night. He came in and he uh, you know, uh, helped us in really uh, you know, get that brand out. But then he said, what are the names? I said, I told him, you know, and I started from scratch, you know, showing him what we were thinking. And I didn't see him comfortable. Uh, and I showed him so many names, so many ideas, so many logos. And then he looked at me just halfway through and he said, you know, why do you think of a logo and a brand? You know, why don't you think of uh, just one thing that, like, you know, if a kid see the M, it is McDonald's. If, uh, you know, um, if you see only the, the M anywhere, you know it's McDonald's. So, you know, you need a brand that is just 
talk about it, uh, talk about itself. You don't need a brand and a logo. So I said to him, you are stealing the, the thing away from me, but let me just go ahead and continue. You know? So as we came in into the last page, and it was the three names, and uh, I can't say them now. It was uh, uh, Ula, which is double O-L-A, if I'm not mistaken, Dr. Nasser, and Uridu, and I can't remember the third one, and uh, His Highness just went and pointed uh, his finger on Uridu. I looked at him, I said to him, Your Highness, this is a big move. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm favoring Uridu, uh, Ula. He said, no, 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 it is Uridu. I said, okay. So uh, he said, when are you gonna launch? I said, it's gonna be after six months in Barcelona uh, at the GSMA, so I do, uh, because I'm mean, I don't want to pay a lot of money. I said, you know, I will use, <laughs> I, I, I will use the venue as a promotion for, uh, uh, for the name and uh, you know, we will capture all the world there. He said, fine, go ahead. So uh, I went back to my friends here and back to the, uh, you know, we were only four people who knew the name. No one knew. So I went and sat with Dr. Nasser. He said to me, no, 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 we can't go for a redo. Come on, it's big, it's a bold move. Uh, I said to him, uh, uh, well, this is the decision of his hand. So I just took the, I swear, I swear to God, I just took the whole thing, you know, in a big bag and I just put it in my office and I kept it for, a year and a half. Halfway, you know, after six months, His Highness uh, told me, he said, when is Barcelona? I said, uh, it's next year. He said, no, no, you told me after three months or four months and you will launch. I said, Your Highness, I, I wasn't really, I didn't have the guts to go ahead and do it. It's, uh, you know, let's think about it. He said, you go and do a redo. So I called Dr. Nasser and I said, okay, it is a redo. It is next year Barcelona, so let's plan for it. So we had the plan. And we went and launched it, and since then, everyone kept criticizing me for the first a year or so. Everyone is complaining, even my family. They said, this is the worst name you've ever uh, you've chosen. But now, everyone loves it, everyone likes, likes it, and even my family now, they said, you had a, a vision before, uh, be, you know, more than us. So thank you so much, guys. Thank you. So, your Excellency, thank you again. Uh, I know you don't need anything to remember Georgetown by, but we just had produced a new uh, thing to, to remember you. us by, and insisted on giving it to you. Thank you. Thank you so thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.